All right, we are officially recording. All right, well, here we go. Uh, last week, we installed the desktop and prepared our machine for uh, database software. And you guys uh, completed your first assignment. And looks like most people did uh, pretty pretty well at it. I think uh, probably just about everybody's going to get full or close to full points. And uh, if we kind of reflect backwards here, just looking at our uh, EC2 instances, uh, we, I, you know, I, I think uh, pretty encouraging to see what guys have accomplished so far. You have provisioned a cloud server instance uh, using an open source operating system. You have uh, provisioned and uh, deployed storage for it, attached it to that machine. You have configured network security rules, and you have a server uh, that's available worldwide at the moment. So uh, that's not uh, not a bad start. I think that uh, uh, you know there's a number of classes might just call that a whole semester, but for us, uh, we've got much more to do, right? So we have uh, we've prepared our server and gotten it to the point where we are ready to actually install a, a database. So first thing I want to do is give you guys an opportunity to ask any questions before we sort of dive right into the uh, next piece of this. And obviously, you all can uh, reach out to me on Skype uh, and or during office hours uh, as well. So uh, unless somebody speaks up, I'm going to keep moving. So. Uh, first thing, hey, uh, next assignments are up there, right? So um, you'll want to make sure that you uh, go and check Blackboard. We, uh, I've uh, posted assignment two, and really what is assignment 2A, and let me uh, go ahead and pull Blackboard up here. So we've completed assignment one. Our next assignment is going to be install the database and a little bit more, right? We're going to uh, install it and, uh, and begin to get familiar with actually uh, operating our database. So uh, I've posted a document which has uh, examples of all the screenshots I want you to provide uh, as your deliverables. Uh, the gist of uh, what we're going to do here in the next couple weeks is install our database software and then um, actually get some databases uh, up and running and uh, get familiar with how to ad administer them, uh, both creating and uh, deleting them as we need to. We're also going to familiarize ourselves with... Um, being able to start and stop the the listener with that device which uh, or that program that runs that actually uh, listens on port 1521 for connections and uh, handles the communication between our database and other client programs we're also going to learn about uh, starting and stopping our databases with SQL plus and uh, we'll discuss environment variables a little bit and this, this idea that there are a number of environment variables that have to be set in order for you to be able to run a lot of your commands uh, related to SQL Plus and the listener. And uh, after we kind of look at the, the manual way of setting those, so we're going to move into setting them automatically. And uh, then we're actually going to set our database up so that it will auto start upon us uh, starting our Linux instance. So uh, we want to be able to basically just go out to EC2 and uh, turn on our machine and have our, our database uh, fire up, right? And uh, we're going to talk a little bit as well about this concept of what is a container database and what is a pluggable database. So the Oracle 12C architecture, uh, the C stands for cloud, and one of the things that they are beginning to do with this version of the database is almost begin to create virtual uh, databases on, on top of a, uh, what I guess you could call a host database instance. So these uh, pluggable databases are actually portable 
across any number of database servers. So uh, I could create a pluggable database and hand it to you, and you could um, you could go ahead and uh, plug that database into your da container database and run that thing. And it would be independent of the operating system. And uh, a little bit later in the semester, we'll explore really what uh, what this means and why it's such a powerful functionality. So for the folks in the 8306 uh, section, uh, besides installing a database, we're going to install a program known as Apex, which is really a, um, I guess, development environment that sits on top of the Oracle database. And really it is a um, means of creating uh, forms and really interacting with your debate database and beginning to create applications on top of your database so um, it's an important uh, and really nice functionality that comes along with the database it also happens to be free so uh, all the database uh, instances if you were to license the Oracle database come with uh, Oracle Apex included and so it's important to know how to install that. And at the end of the day, it's really not that difficult. So uh, if you're 8306 student, this is a required assignment. And if you're looking for some extra credit, uh, 4,300 students can uh, earn themselves 50 points if they'd like to turn this assignment in, but it isn't, uh, isn't required for the 4,300 folks. So uh, go out, take a look at the assignments. Uh, I believe this one is due in three weeks, and this one is, is due the week after that. So make sure you go out and check that and uh, know when that's due. And then we're going to focus over the next couple weeks uh, really preparing you to uh, uh, turn in these assignments. So. Uh, we are going to be installing our very own databases on the server that we uh, deployed. So providing uh, you have done everything uh, correctly, uh, you should be ready to install a database at this point on your EC2 instance. And um, we, uh, we're gonna go ahead and get started with that tonight. Now there's a couple, uh, you know, uh, there's a number of things we're going to do here over the next probably couple weeks. One, we're going to make sure we have the database software SQL developer installed, uh, downloaded and installed. We're going to create a couple databases and we're going to learn how to start and stop them. And then we're going to get a lot of that uh, auto uh, start stuff set up so that we don't have to mess with it uh, in the future. Uh, important prerequisites, uh, and there's three things, uh, I, I, two things I really want to touch on and make sure you have squared away before you install your database, and one that uh, is going to be convenient for us down the line. So one, uh, um, SQL developer, uh, we need to make sure that we have the latest version of that installed, so I'm just going to walk through that quickly tonight. Uh, including the JDK. It was included in uh, last week's slides, and you may have already uh, done this, and then if you have, great. Uh, if you haven't, uh, we'll just take a couple minutes. Another very important uh, item before you install your database is to make sure that the host file entry has been completed uh, on your instance. And then uh, last thing, we'll just wanna make sure you get Flash installed uh, because the uh, EM uh, utility that, that comes with the database that allows us to kind of see what's going on with the database uh, depends on Flash, so we'll need to look that up. Um, the other thing I want to make sure that you do, because uh, it's entirely possible that you're going to hurt your machine at some point, and you don't want to uh, have to redo all this work in order to get yourself back up to speed, is make sure you back it up. So uh, I just want to show you one more time in EC2, if you would like to back up your machine, you simply select it and then under actions, go to image and create image. And uh, this is fairly self-explanatory. When you create an image, it's gonna show up over here under AMIs. 
And uh, this is kind of how I manage, uh, you know, moving ahead and backing up to where we are each week. Uh, I'll have several backups at any given time that are saved at a particular state uh, as we're going along in this process. Then uh, should you uh, irrevocably damage your machine somehow or another, you can always come back to your backup and then just uh, go ahead and launch one of these. And uh, basically it just fires it up as if you're going through the creation process of, uh, that you went through with your uh, server that you built, but it will create a server that has uh, all the stuff done that was done to your backup. So it's a, it's a great utility. I highly encourage you to use it and uh, sooner or later it will save your bacon. So uh, do that. All right, so uh, first thing then, um, I'm just gonna dive right in and let me go ahead and switch uh, which share I am on here. And we will jump over to uh, my Linux instance. All right, so uh, first thing that I talked about was making sure that you had your host file entry correct. So simple way to do this, if you're in your desktop, uh, just right click it, open in terminal, and then uh, I'm gonna go ahead and just switch, or actually use the Vim editor, which is just VI, and um, I'm gonna wanna sudo to do this, to be able to edit, sudo VI underscore hosts. And so, oh, sorry, that's host. So here's a, scenario and you guys will probably run into this actually cr instead of opening a file created the file because I mistyped the name and uh, it just automatically thinks you want to create a file and, and creates one for you so if you want to get out of this without actually having created a new file I'm just going to hit escape colon Q and the exclamation point which basically means hey uh, quit this editing session and uh, and don't write this file I'm okay with that it's also a great way to get out of trouble if uh, if you were trying to edit a file and then you accidentally did something that you didn't want to and you just want to start over. Uh, that'll allow you to get out of the file without writing any of your changes as well. So what I meant to put in there was a path to the etc directory and the host file there. So now you can see I have opened up my host file and uh, what you will see if you haven't made this entry already is just these local host entries here. Uh, we wanna make sure that we put in this, this IP uh, whatever it is for your particular machine uh, as well and this will, uh, trust me, save uh, bad things from happening during your uh, database installation. So in order to get this, uh, there's two things you can do. One, you can just kind of look at the top of your window here and you're going to see, hey, IP-172-31-19-140. Hey, that's my host name. So if you're opening a window up here, you'll be able to see your host name in that window. Uh, if you want to sort of make it easy so you can copy paste it, um, you can always, uh, from the command line here, just type host name, and that'll give you your host name, and then you can copy it. So be sure to edit this file and make sure that this host name is in it, um, or you're going to have future problems, uh, I promise you. All right, so the other thing that we're gonna wanna do, beside uh, that host file, is we wanna make sure that uh, Java's installed, and so I, I covered this last week, um, if you type in uh, Oracle uh, JDK, you know, Java JDK, uh, you should find yourself out here at the uh, SE Development Kit. And uh, you just want to make sure that you get the, the right one, this uh, Linux X64 RPM. And uh, if you download this, you can go ahead and just let the software installer on uh, Linux uh, install it for you and, uh, and all will be well. And you'll need that in order to be able to run uh, SQL Developer. So uh, SQL Developer, uh, same thing. If you type in Oracle SQL Developer, you should find yourself here. And uh, again, you're going to want to make sure you get the Linux RPM. And then you're just going to want to download this thing. And um, 
and then we can go ahead and install this one uh, manually. So if you have configured your Firefox uh, properly, then all your downloads should be going to this uh, INV folder. So uh, if you haven't done that, do that. Uh, we created that specifically for the uh, next download that we're going to concern ourselves with, and that's the um, the 12C uh, database software download. And if you're uh, looking to follow along at home tonight, then I would encourage you to get this uh, this download started right here. So you're going to want the uh, database 12C release 12.1.0.2 for Linux x86-64. And you're going to want both of these files for both the uh, SQL developer and the 12C. You're going to need to accept the license agreement, and uh, then it'll ask you for your Oracle account credentials, which uh, I've already gone through the, the process of downloading these two files. So uh, once you uh, have SQL developer downloaded, um, you're going to want to go ahead and install it and uh, you can see I've got it here in my INV directory and uh, I'm going to uh, install it but one of the things that's going to be important uh, after I install this is we're going to want to actually know the location of our uh, Java install because we're going to need it and so um, the easiest thing to do is uh, if you switch to CD USR for user and Java, you should find the JDK that you will have installed. And uh, what the uh, SQL developer is going to ask you for is actually a, a path to this uh, JDK folder. I'm going to go ahead and switch to that. And then uh, ultimately, it's going to want to get to this uh, this bin directory. I believe the path we give it here is just this um, path to the JDK folder, and then it can discover the bin directory and get all the th sort of things it needs to to run SQL Developer. So uh, to install SQL Developer, I'm just going to type in sudo yum. And then I'm just going to type the first couple letters, hit the tab key to um, auto-complete that. Oh, why are you fighting me here? Oh, it's, oh I see. Sudo, my bad. Yum install. And then I'm going to auto-complete or try to auto-complete. There it goes, just being a little slow on me tonight. All right, so sometimes um, this thing can be a little bit slow in responding to you, but. And sometimes it can just be downright disagreeable. Oh. Sorry, I typed in a bad command. So really all it's doing right now is going out and searching to see if it can find something called uh, SQL clear. Uh, I should be able to kill that with uh, control C. Uh, now I'm just gonna clear my screen up again, list the inventory of my directory again, and then go uh, yum install. And let's see, I don't know why SQL, why the autocomplete is fighting me so much tonight. So I will just copy paste this thing. Try to copy paste this thing. And then I'm gonna put uh, dash Y in there. And um, nope, forgot my sudo command that time. So if I hit the up arrow key, I can always just get the command I just issued back. And, um, oh, sorry. Need a space in there. In there. Um, oh, okay. So here, what has actually happened here is I've tried to install this uh, RPM package with uh, yum and 
Um, I think I may actually already have this thing installed. So if we go and have a look here, that's what it's basically telling me. It's like, hey, uh, SQL Developer is already installed on your machine, so there's nothing to do here. Um, so if you, um, and I'm sorry, I didn't think I had it installed on this instance, but uh, this is the basic command right here if you're going to install it. You can also let the software install it, do it for you, but sudo yum install the SQL developer RPM that we downloaded and then just dash y to let it uh, do its thing. So uh, another thing that you'll want to do the, the very first time that you run SQL developer and we'll see if I've done it with this, is you should be able to just type in the command SQL developer after it's been installed. And when you do that, it'll run uh, SQL developer. And because I've already done this um, once, it's just gonna go ahead and uh, open SQL developer for me. But if, uh, if this is the very first time that you've run SQL developer, um, what's going to happen is it's going to actually ask you for a path to a JDK right here. And this is where this path over here that, um, uh, that we found for our JDK becomes important. Need to put that in there. And then uh, if it opens uh, uh, properly at that point, then you're all ready to go. And uh, from that point forward, you'll just be able to use this uh, menu shortcut that it installs for you under this programming um, item on the menu. So uh, for some reason, the, the very first time it, uh, you open it, you have to go in there and give it that JDK path. But uh, after that point, it saves that and then it will go ahead and, um, and, uh, and work from the menu no problem. We're going to get into how to use SQL Developer here uh, after we've installed our database. You can technically control your database from the um, SQL Plus utility, which comes along with it. But uh, I find that to be kind of uh, clunky and just painful to use. And I much prefer to use something like SQL Developer, which has a nice graphical interface and really greatly simplifies a number of the administration tasks. Uh, that we do with the database. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and close that for now because I don't have any use for it at the moment. And uh, next thing that we're going to do is after we've gotten SQL Developer installed, uh, we're pretty much ready to install our database. Um, you may want to get your uh, flash uh, taken care of. You can really do this anytime and it isn't uh, dependent uh, you know, the database isn't dependent on it in any way. But if you go out and look for the uh, Adobe Flash Player for, for Linux, you should find yourself to this page. And then uh, if you choose the Yum for Linux and click Download, when it prompts you, the software installer on Linux prompts you, hey, do you want to install this? Uh, just say yes. And then that should uh, will allow us to use the uh, EM uh, utility, which uh, we'll see after we get our uh, database installed and, and get done playing with it. All right, so to install the database, if you've downloaded your software, you will find that you have a couple of files that looks like this, right? You got a couple of zip files. And so the very first thing you're gonna need to do uh, with these zip files is uh, unzip them. And uh, thankfully, that command is uh, pretty easy to do. And we want to unzip these files right into this particular directory because this directory has the space to hold uh, both the zip files and, and the uncompressed versions of the files. And then when we run the installer, it's actually going to install to the U01 directory that uh, we uh, created for our database. So <clears throat> I'm going to go ahead and hit uh, unzip and then hit the tab key to autocomplete. You'll see it'll get as far as it can uh, with the file path and then it wants me to give it a little more information. I'm going to go ahead and say, hey, let's unzip the first um, one of these zip files and then I'm going to go ahead and hit enter. And you'll see that that is uh, actually creating or unzipping a pretty good volume of stuff. I want to say when this thing is all unzipped, it's somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, 
six or seven gigs. So it's, uh, it's not small. There's no question about that. So this just this doesn't take too long to get done. Maybe uh, a minute or two. It's just really uh, unzipping everything it needs. And then I'm going to clean my screen up here, uh, list, and then you'll see that we've got a new directory here called uh, database. Now, when we unzip our uh, second zip file, it should uh, auto magically know that uh, it needs to put uh, its contents into that directory as well. So. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and just type unzip and uh, a couple first couple letters. I know this is going to be the second file and auto complete that and go ahead hit enter. And uh, we can see that that is unzipping itself to that same uh, database directory that it created inside of our inventory directory. And we'll give this a second. And now we can see that this one has uh, gone ahead and finished as well. So I'm going to go ahead and, and clean my screen up again. And uh, you can see right here, hey, uh, <laughs> this thing is telling me already, hey, you're, you're getting down there uh, on the amount of space. Now, one of the things that we can do is once we uh, have this installed, uh, one, we can go ahead and uh, just uh, pitch these files, um, or we could actually uh, move these directories, uh, move this disk uh, off of here and attach another one if we wanted to. But honestly, once we have our database software installed, we're not going to have any reason to hold on to these things anymore. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and clean up the screen list one more time, and now I'm going to switch to this database directory. And if we list the contents of this directory, you'll see now uh, that we have um, a number of uh, things inside of here. And really what we're concerned with is this uh, run installer. And it's, it's green on here because that means it's an executable. And if we want to execute this on a Linux system, we just hit dot slash and then we uh, complete the file name. I'm going to choose autocomplete, and then when I hit enter, uh, it will fire up the, uh, the actual GUI that installs our database. And um, this has everything to do with why we installed a desktop uh, for our Oracle database server. Now, we could have, in theory, done this uh, either from the command line or uh, and, and sort of run through all this stuff that way, or uh, we could have done it through MOBA Xterm and, and run this uh, GUI sort of remotely, but it's uh, painfully slow, and there's a lot of great reasons for us to have a desktop when uh, we're, we have a development system like this. So first thing it's going to ask us about is whether we want to you know, look for updates or anything like that. Um, you have to give Oracle money in order to have a support policy, so even if you put your email in here, it isn't going to help you. Uh, so we're just going to go ahead and say no. It's going to say, hey, are you sure you want to do this horribly unadvisable thing? And we're going to say, yep, we're, we're sure about that. So then it just uh, begins to walk us through the install process. So we want to create and configure a database. And so uh, at this point, it gives us a choice of whether we want to use you know, what class we want to do. So if we were just looking for a quick and dirty development uh, box because we wanted to do, um, you know, sort of SQL-based stuff, uh, we could choose this desktop class and it would sort of uh, greatly simplify the installation options that we had available to us. We're actually going to choose this server class uh, because we want to have a little more control over the installation that we're doing. And then uh, it's also going to ask us whether or not we're just doing a single database or something called uh, Rack or Real Application Clusters. Uh, we're not going to concern ourselves with Rack. Uh, just be aware that uh, the concept behind uh, the Rack for the database is that you can have uh, multiple database uh, instances presumably located on different servers that can all uh, act as one uh, database and the, the purpose of that is kind of twofold one is uh, high availability and then the other purpose of that is to um, 
be able to apply uh, multiple physical machines to a uh, what is essentially a single database uh, instance, if you will. So um, we're going to go ahead and say single database instance. Uh, again, this typical install just sort of limits the number of things that we have available to us. We're going to go ahead and choose the advanced install. And I'm going to go ahead and click Next. And so now it's really going to give us uh, lots of choices. Uh, obviously, the database supports a, a large number of languages. Uh, I'm going to assume for our purposes that we're going with English. And then it's just telling us, hey, uh, we're going to put the enterprise edition of the database on here. And, and here's the amount of uh, space that it's going to um, take up. And so the enterprise edition uh, is the sort of uh, biggest, baddest database that you can get from Oracle. They also make their database uh, available in what's called the standard edition one and standard edition. And these are just sort of lesser cost instances of the database. They're still very powerful, but don't necessarily have all of the options that the enterprise edition uh, has. And uh, there's a number of things that the enterprise edition has, uh, such as advanced analytics and partitioning and uh, several other uh, options that you can uh, sort of buy a la carte should that be a uh, type of functionality that uh, your organization needs. And so uh, a lot of uh, especially larger organizations are going to be going with these uh, enterprise editions. But uh, depending on your use case, you might uh, use one of these uh, other editions as well. So now we can see uh, kind of the purpose of that UO1 directory. That is uh, the standard um, uh, format uh, for the directory system that the database is installing. And so uh, the installation software uh, auto detects that UO1 directory. And then it tells you about all of these uh, directories that it's going to create underneath that directory to put the uh, software in. So we can see, uh, you know, it's telling us about our base directory, and it's also telling us uh, where our software is going to be. You could conceivably uh, change this. Um, you also could install multiple uh, instances of a database server on one machine. So you could have UO1, UO2, UO3. Uh, and then there isn't anything particular about the UO1 that is required. You, you know, this could be Fred uh, as easy as UO1. Uh, but this is sort of the standard uh, that uh, a lot of people use and Oracle expects. And so uh, we're going to stick with it as well. All right. So then, again, it's just telling us about uh, where it's going to install a bunch of stuff and also, um, you know, the group name that uh, is going to be using as a part of this. And this was... This group O install was created when we uh, ran the script to create the Oracle user uh, way back uh, probably uh, two weeks ago now. So uh, now it gives us this ability to choose a general purpose or, or data warehousing, and these would be, uh, in theory, optimized for uh, either purpose. So, you know, if you think ERP system, accounting systems, the things that uh, handle the transactions for everyday uh, large enterprise use, then that's what this general purpose one is for. And then if you think about data warehousing, that's kind of a whole different animal in the way that, um, you know, the data is normalized and, and constructed. So, you know, um, the database can obviously be optimized for either one of these. Uh, this general purpose is going to be fine for uh, for our purposes, and in general, will pretty much do anything you need it to do. So here's the first uh, spot where you can actually make a decision uh, should you want to, uh, and we're getting into the concept of uh, whether or not uh, we want to use a container database and a, and a pluggable database here. So in assignment one, uh, one of our first assignments is to create a database called my 
CDB1. So we might as well go ahead and do that while we're at it. This global database name is a way to uniquely identify databases within your organization. You could, uh, in theory, also use a, a domain name uh, after this, and some people do, but it isn't necessary. Uh, and then the system identifier is really uh, what we're going to use to identify the database that we want to connect to when we're connecting to the database with the external applications. Uh, so we are going to create this as a container database. And so my container database one is really what that uh, is meant to stand for. And then uh, we're also going to create a, a pluggable database. And another uh, thing that is part of assignment one is to create my PDB one on, oops, sorry, I used an exclamation point there, on my CDB one. All right. And so, uh, what I'm really trying to get across here is this idea that this pluggable database really lives on top of the container database that we're creating. And uh, this entire structure here is, uh, is portable. So it can be detached from its container instance and, uh, and move to another one. And uh, at some point in the semester, we'll actually go through that exercise so you can truly understand uh, what this means. But for now, we're just gonna create the, the MyCDB be one and then uh, the first pluggable database we can create uh, geez I want to say it's like up to 256 maybe more in the current uh, instance but it was 256 pluggable databases on top of this container database so each one of these uh, pluggable databases is a sort of standalone instance of, uh, of a database as far as any applications or, or end users are concerned so I'm going to go ahead and hit next there. And then here it's uh, uh, asking them us about the, the memory management. And uh, we're going to go ahead and allow the uh, software to decide how to uh, manage memory. We'll talk about a lot of the different memory structures inside of the database as we go on through the semester. And a lot of your, your reading will talk about this as well. Uh, we're going to let the, and, and probably the best thing to do these days, uh, especially if you're not a uh, sort of very uh, advanced DBA who sort of knows exactly what they're doing, is allow Oracle to handle this part of the process for you. Uh, and then it will automatically alloc allocate memory to the different structures that need it, depending on, uh, on the demands for those structures at any given time. The other thing we want to do is we want to set our character set, and we're going to use Unicode. Uh, so it's, uh, it, it defaults to this web MS one. Uh, we don't want to use that. Uh, we want to use the Unicode one. Um, this really uh, sets up uh, the, uh, you know, being able to do multi-language, which we're not necessarily uh, concerned with, but I've just found this uh, character set to sort of be the one uh, that uh, is, is the least problematic uh, for um, handling data. And uh, it'll be important that um, we know, uh, uh, we explicitly do this on, on the databases that we create because the one sort of caveat for the pluggable databases is, although they aren't dependent on operating system, and for instance, I can move a pluggable database from a Linux to a Windows, instance, uh, they are dependent on character set. Uh, so if the character sets are different, uh, then you aren't going to be able to move them around. So uh, that's an important detail to make sure we get right. And the last thing we want to do is uh, Oracle provides a number of sample schemas that um, a lot of their examples are based on. So if you go out there and uh, look at the documentation and uh, they show you how to do a lot of SQL functions and all sorts of uh, stuff with the database. These, those are generally based on these sample schemas uh, that you can choose to install. So we are definitely going to install those. Those will put uh, some users and some data into our database and sort of give us uh, something other than just a completely empty database to work with. So next, uh, you can see that um, 
we can uh, choose what we're going to do from a file management standpoint. So this is really where your Oracle data files are going to end up living. And um, we could uh, use the automatic storage management, which certainly has uh, advantages. But for the purposes of what we're uh, going to do with, with this database, we're just going to go ahead and let the file system uh, or, or let it choose a default location on the file system. Now, uh, know that we could, uh, if we wanted to get real fancy on, uh, on our database, we could actually attach a separate storage and mount it uh, to a directory where we uh, told uh, the database to uh, put our, our, our data files. And, and we could then... Um, you know, have an even sort of greater degree of uh, portability and, and backup uh, with our database by uh, isolating those data files. We're not going to concern ourselves with that. Uh, we fired up a 30 gig instance, which is uh, more than enough space to hold our uh, Oracle software, database software, as well as the, as the data files that uh, will be created to hold data in our database. So I'm going to go ahead and click next here, taking the defaults. Um, uh, it is possible to control multiple Oracle databases with one instance of this uh, enterprise manager. Uh, we're not going to be doing that, so we don't need to uh, register uh, our instance with a uh, centralized uh, enterprise manager here. So I'm going to go ahead and click next there. Um, we're also uh, not going to concern ourselves with uh, recovery right now. We're just going to kind of focus on uh, handling uh, getting a database uh, set up. So now you really move to another important part where you um, are going to set up a bunch of passwords. Uh, you could, and on a production system, you most likely would set different passwords for all of these admin accounts for the sake of sanity and to make it easy to remember them, we're just gonna set them all to the same password here. So, um, and I would suggest probably just stick them with the same password you've been using for everything else here, um, just to keep your life easy because, um, you know, we've had a lot of things that need a lot of different passwords and it become kind of a nightmare to manage all that. So with these dev boxes, a lot of times it's just easier to set the passwords all the same and, uh, and then you don't have to concern yourself with forgetting them. So I'm going to set the password for those. And now um, it's going to ask me sort of uh, some more stuff about the, the groups again. Take your defaults here. Um, uh, the database install has everything it needs in order to uh, install the database here. And so now at this point, it's just going to kind of run through and do some pre-checks, make sure that it has enough space uh, to actually install the database. Uh, it's going to check uh, a number of every other things. And then it's going to sort of list out, okay, here's where I'm going to put uh, all of this stuff. Here's all of the options that you choose. And this is sort of your last chance. Uh, should you uh, um, decide that uh, you, you messed one of these things up, you can change your mind before we go ahead and install. Uh, you can also do a thing here that's called a, a response file. And uh, you can save a response file. And that's actually a means of automating uh, database creation. So uh, we are using a GUI interface to create a database, but you can actually script this. And so you could uh, auto magically create databases uh, by just running an operating system script. And uh, a response file would be a mechanism where you could give the install process everything it needed to know in order to go ahead and create a database. And uh, that can be extremely handy uh, if you are, have a sort of standard database architecture that you uh, implement for multiple purposes or if you have uh, some reason to be automatically provisioning uh, databases. So in any case, uh, we should be good with everything that we chose here. And then you can go ahead and click the uh, install. And so this process, the first time around, is going to take... Um, you know, probably the better part of 10 or 15 minutes. 
Um, there's, it's kind of, it's got a lot of stuff to do. It's a, it's got to write all of the software to its various location. It's going to go ahead and, and create a database and, um, configure that database so it's uh, ready to use that uh, my CDB1 database is going to be uh, all stood up and accessible for us um, uh, as soon as this process uh, completes. So important thing to know is uh, that we uh, this utility that we're using this graphical interface interface that you're looking at here is called the DBCA or the database creation assistant and we're actually going to use that to uh, as part of assignment one to create the the various databases um, that uh, we're going to need. So we're going to create uh, two container database instances and then several uh, pluggable database instances um, as, as we go along here as part of this assignment. So having um, created uh, or gotten that thing going, uh, I can open up for questions and I can see here that uh, there's a question about does Amazon charge us extra for creating images? So uh, the answer to that question is yes, uh, there's a storage cost associated uh, with that. It's, uh, it's relatively minimal. Uh, so, uh, I mean, I think it's measured in, you know, literally pennies. Um, one, the, the biggest cost you're going to incur is, you know, if you stack up lots and lots and lots of those uh, images then sure you're gonna you're gonna start uh, kind of incurring a bunch of cost uh, what I would say is hey you know snapshot the thing at various points where uh, you know it's gonna be super painful to have to redo your work and uh, if you move along to sort of another checkpoint where you um, feel like you you aren't going to need to go way back to one of the other AMIs, then uh, you can just go ahead and delete that thing. And uh, that's one way to sort of keep them from building up and costing you money that way. The other big thing, which I think I've said again and again and again, and I'll say it again here, is make sure that you're shutting your instances off uh, when they're not in use. Um, because of the type of database software that we're installing here, we have a uh, relatively private um, or a relatively powerful instance and uh, so if you leave it on all the time it's going to cost you some money so um, yeah I'm gonna put um, I'm gonna put the most of the steps into the PowerPoint slides when I post them here um, and then there's a, a couple things I'm going to let you guys figure out as well. That's another question that came in. So uh, I haven't posted those uh, slides up there yet. But the the one thing I want you to get comfortable with with the DB with database creation assistance is understanding that you can do this iterative, iteratively, right? You can do you can install and uninstall and install and uninstall uh, databases and um, it, it won't hurt anything. So uh, it, you won't, uh, it won't really matter if you mess anything up. Uh, you, can always, uh, you can always do it again. So okay, one of the things it's gonna ask you to do here as you, when you get to a certain point in the install, is it's gonna have uh, two uh, scripts it wants you to run that uh, handle some of the things that the database needs from, from an OS perspective. And you're gonna need to run these as, as the root user. So uh, really what you can do is just type in sudo, which means switch to the root user. You should be able to copy the script path right out of, uh, right out of this window and paste it, and then just go ahead and hit enter, and you can see that uh, that runs really fast. And then this uh, second one, same thing. Type in sudo and paste. We'll run this again. And then it's really uh, asking us about some of the default locations for um, some of the environment parameters. We're going to go ahead and just accept the defaults by hitting enter. And uh, now, if we say OK, the database uh, installation can continue. 
And so then uh, at this point, your database software is installed and uh, it's actually creating uh, a database, uh, the MyCDB uh, one that, um, that we told it to create. So uh, you can see uh, that it's walking through this uh, progress right now, creating everything it needs in order to um, create this database. Right now it's creating a container database and then it'll move on to creating the pluggable databases. So um, once this completes, uh, we can actually run the this database configuration assistant uh, multiple times uh, and uh, each time tell it that uh, we want to install or uninstall or, or do some sort of uh, maintenance on our database. So this process here, you can see it says it's about 92% done, is going to take uh, at least a few minutes. So this is a good point where I think let's take a um, – Let's go ahead and take a like a 15 minute break. I'll start back up at uh, 9.05. I see it's uh, 8.52 here. So I'm gonna just let this process run. I'll leave the window out up, uh, but I'm gonna go ahead and just shut off here for a minute. If anybody has any questions uh, about anything, uh, this is a good time to ask. And then if not, uh, we'll just pick up on this process here in uh, in about uh, 10, 12 more minutes. All right, so I don't see anybody uh, popping up with, uh, with any questions, so um, I'm going to go ahead and shut my camera off and, and mute my mic, and uh, I will rejoin here at, uh, at 9.05.